Hello, I'm Sharon Cotter, and this is Sandra Harris, and this is a program called Getting to Know You. Uh, Betty Ozan came up with the idea, and she thought she wanted fireside chats, but we thought in Arizona that probably wouldn't be too good. So instead, we're just having a chat. <laughs> and um, we look forward to Sandra's information. She's an amazing woman, and we're looking forward to hearing good things. Thanks, Sharon, for inviting me to do this. Looking back on my 82 years from that vantage point, I think of the decade of my 30s as the most significant in my life, and so that's where I'm going to begin. When I was 30, I was living in Eugene, Oregon. I was the mother of three daughters, ages six, three, and one. I was the wife of the dean of the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. He was a young dean, just 33 years old, and the school had six departments and 80 faculty. So part of my role as a dean's wife would be to help new faculty find housing to give a party for a faculty uh, resigning or retiring and to entertain visiting architects. I enjoyed, I enjoyed doing this. We were living in a house that my husband designed. It was on a hill overlooking the campus. It was surrounded by evergreens and live oaks. It was not a large house, but it was well designed. It had three sleeping alcoves, triangular shaped, for these three young girls, where they could open up the window and pick wild blackberries to eat. So it was a lovely, natural environment. The university was offering a parent education class. It was open to the public. And I thought, I can be a better parent, and so I'm going to take that class. It, you didn't have to take a grade or anything. And so I sat in on this parent education, and I left feeling that I had to do something for myself. It was almost a decade that I had been devoted to my children and to my husband helping with his career but I was missing something. So I thought I'm going to apply to the Masters in School Counseling. I have my bachelor's degree already and uh, taught school for a year before I had my daughters. And I applied and lo and behold, I was admitted. But I was too afraid to go back to school. I didn't think that I could compete in graduate work. I asked if they would just hold my application until next year when my youngest would be in kindergarten instead of nursery school. I thought I would have more time to do it and I went for psychotherapy. I told the psychiatrist I've been accepted to the university but I'm too frightened to go. I need to go but that's why I'm here. So after six months, she said, you need to be in school, which is what I had told her in the first place. But she gave me the kick in the pants that I needed, and I was then enrolled for the master's program. My final project was expanding the career horizons of young girls. I had group counseling for fifth and sixth grade girls. I thought that by the early 70s, this was 10 years past the women's liberation, which is a misnomer if I've ever heard one. Uh, 10 years past, they would have broader career goals than me, but they still wanted to be either secretary, nurse, housewife, or teacher. So I conducted these, these groups, had some success, and published 
uh, my article was published in Vocational Guidance Quarterly while I was still a master's student, and that caught the eye of university psychology professors. At that time, universities were uh, needing to expand their uh, educational programs at the higher levels. And so there was affirmative action in which women were considered minorities. And I was invited to stay in school, and so I am an affirmative action beneficiary. My oldest daughter was about 10 at this time. Some of you may recall meeting my daughter Diane, who gave a lecture here on ancient Greece, um, Dr. Diane Harris Klein, but I'm now talking about her childhood. So she was 10 when I was a doctoral student. I completed my work and right on schedule, I became very efficient, good at time management, used all of the time my girls were in school. Those were my precious hours that I could study. And I did my post-graduate uh, year and then was eligible to sit for licensure. This is an, a national exam, which I passed. So I was then a licensed psychologist in Oregon, but there were no jobs. It's still a small university town, so I opened a private practice, which was small, and did that for three years. My husband then accepted a position at USC as dean of the School of Architecture, and that is what took the family to Los Angeles. That was a difficult transition. Diane was away at college by now. The other two were in high school. And to move from this idyllic town to Los Angeles, at the time that interest rates were 18%, <laughs> was not easy. But the silver lining was that there were lots of jobs for psychologists. They probably needed more of it there. But I got a job right away as a clinical psychologist at California State University, Northridge, which is a, a, t a town on the outskirts to the north of Los Angeles. And the university uh, was a very diverse student population, ra ranging in age from 18 to about 50, lots of people coming back to school, talking now about the early 80s. And I developed uh, specialties in anxiety reduction. I want to tell you about two different kinds of anxiety for which I used the technique of in vivo desensitization. In vivo meaning in real life, desensitizing to the feared uh, event or, th or thing. In other words, doing it for real instead of just talking about it. I'm going to talk briefly about musical performance anxiety reduction and public speaking anxiety. Cal State Northridge had an excellent music school, and so students would come with their anxiety about their recitals, about their auditions, about their performances, and I would have groups for musicians, for example, a singer's group where they would perform for each other and I, I could then work with them. I conducted mock um, concerts in which I would make a program. The program would say Jim Smith is playing the violin concerto, uh, Mary Jones is going to sing an aria, and then my colleagues, psychologists, would come and be the audience. And so they were giving their um, performances in front of a, a real group, and then I could give them feedback. 
You can imagine a, a timpani player who has to crash the cymbals right on the beat and the anxiety that that would induce if they did it wrong. And um, so I then did a research study where I asked music teachers in conservatories of music and in universities how they helped students with their musical performance anxiety. And I wrote an article for the American Music Teacher Journal and also wrote articles about how a psychologist helps students with that anxiety. And I also, also traveled around the state to music teachers' conferences to help them. Public speaking anxiety is the most common fear, the most common fear. If you have ever felt uh, anxiety about public speaking, you are not alone. This probably starts, they have done studies of young children, maybe three years old. Some hold back, some are reticent to speak, some are shy, others are little chatterboxes, you can't keep them quiet, they're very outgoing, and these are probably innate dispositions. But they can last a lifetime and inhibit a person from doing what they might want to do. And so you can imagine uh, if part of your grade in a university was dependent on participation in class or giving an oral report, then you might come to the counseling service in order to get help with that. So I had public speaking groups. And I'd like to tell you about a kind of innovative program in which I consulted with an engineer who had developed a program in virtual reality for public speaking. And what this is, it's a small counseling room that we're in, but the student is wearing goggles and is giving a speech wearing the goggles and the view that he or she sees is a red curtain opening and an audience. Now, to me, the audience looked like stick figures, but what had been shown in research was that even a virtual audience arouses the anxiety symptoms as much as a real audience. So we could use that instead of actually giving speeches uh, to, uh, to a real audience. The fun part of it, though, was that using the keyboard as the therapist, I could manipulate that audience. And so they could be applauding, they could be hissing, they could be booing, they could get up and leave, and the student is still giving the speech. I also was um, trained and certified in biofeedback. And so I was doing physiological measurements where the fingertip temperature was being measured by a handheld thermometer. You know that our hands and feet get cold when we're anxious and they warm up when we are relaxed. So I could measure what temperature the fingers were starting at in the beginning and in the end. I was also, I had electrodes for the heart rate. <laughs> and so this program was somewhat successful. And I wrote an article that was then in a biofeedback journal of some kind. The Northridge earthquake hit. January 4th, 1994, at 4 in the morning. I was a psychologist on that campus. And you may have heard of the Northridge earthquake, which was 7.1. It knocked the administration building, huge building, off its uh, foundation. There was no usable academic building on that campus. They brought in 300 trailers as classrooms. 
and our counseling was done in tents that winter. Psychologists from Northern California who that had experienced the Loma Prieta earthquake a few years before came to train our staff in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, I'm sure you've heard of that, post meaning after, traumatic, that would be a traumatic event, which could be a natural disaster like this was, or a hurricane like Laura, or a, a mugging, a car accident, or combat. I then began to work with students who kept coming and saying, you know, I'm still so anxious and I'm still uh, thinking about it and having flashbacks about it. And they, it might be three years, four years later. Of course, the earth shakes there a lot, and I believe there were about 500 aftershakes, aftershocks. And uh, so each of those would trigger the uh, original anxiety feelings. And I, I then understood that post-traumatic stress is a long-term uh, disorder or problem. And um, I, I, I had that good experience as a result of that earthquake. At the same time, I felt very proud of being a psychologist and had never intended to be or set out to be, so that I joined my professional association, which was the California Psychological Association, the largest state association in the country, it was 5,000 members. I enjoyed attending their conferences. I was their president in 1996 and was past president the next year. And then I was elected one of two positions in the state to represent California psychologists at the APA, the American Psychological Association. And then I was re-elected twice for three-year terms. So for almost a decade, I went to the APA meetings quarterly, flying from Los Angeles to Washington, DC, where I walked the halls of Congress lobbying for mental health. Also around that time, I took a national test to, to belong to the American Institute of Parliamentarians. The California Psych Association was a large board of 45 members from around the state. And it was uh, rather intimidating to conduct those meetings. And I thought a parliamentarian who knew the rules and who knew Robert's Rules of Order would be helpful, and I was appointed by 10 uh, presidents that followed me to be their advisor and sit with them at the meetings as their parliamentarian. So I had lived in the Los Angeles area, commuting on those freeways, if anyone has commuted on Los Angeles freeways for 25 years. I'd also been a dean's wife for 25 years. And I was ready uh, to reti retire. At the same time, my middle daughter, Elaine, and her family were going to move to a small town. They had been living also in the LA area. They were going to move to a smaller town in a county called Kern County. And uh, I said, well, I'll move too, because I've worked long enough. And so I moved there, and I'm unpacking, plugging in my computer, plugging in my printer, and out comes a job announcement 
It was sent to licensed psychologists in the state, and the job is in Kern County in the VA, which reports to the VA in Westwood, Los Angeles. And it was for part-time work, two days a week, and I thought, well, I can do that. I applied, and I got the job. And a few months later, it was expanded to full-time. So I was now working after retirement as a full-time VA psychologist. The silver lining in that was that it was the best job that I had had. I worked with veterans of all wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan, primarily Vietnam veterans were coming back to the VA. That I'm there 30 years post the war in uh, Vietnam. They had originally come to the VA seeking help, but the VA had downsized from World War II. They didn't anticipate ever needing to be that big again. So they had downsized, and they didn't anticipate the kinds of problems that were being presented to them. These were young boys, the average age 19, compared to 24 in World War II. That made a big difference. And they didn't know that much about post-traumatic stress treatment anyway. So they were sent away, you know, suck it up, be a man, uh, you can handle it. And they weren't ready to come back for 30 years. And so I was then the only psychologist in Kern County VA. I couldn't turn any of them away. So I saw 80 to 90 veterans a week, primarily in groups, the groups being larger than what I would want as a typical group. They might be 15 or 18, could be Marines. It could be from different wars. I had groups, uh, for a group for women who were not treated well that many years ago they weren't wanted in the military. And um, I did that for five years when my middle daughter Elaine said they were moving to Arizona. <laughs> and then my choice was to stay at the good job that I had but without family or to move to Arizona with family. And by then, the two young girls, uh, one was in college in California, and one was going to go to ASU, and there was a two-year-old grandson involved. So, of course, my decision was to move. But I dreaded telling the veterans that I was leaving because I knew that it would be another loss to them, and they had lost their buddies. They had lost their families. Their families they were estranged from because of the public's feelings about the war. Thank goodness we don't blame the veterans anymore for the wars. So the public has changed its attitude since then. But I had to tell them, and then I want to share with you my prized possession. This is a collage that I was, sorry, I was given in a group and it was uh, from a wife of a veteran. It has the word hope on it and I want to read to you some of the, I'm okay, some of the inscriptions from the back. Thanks for helping us and putting up with us. There is a God, and I know he is well pleased with the care you have given us. We all thank you. God bless. 
since being in the sessions, I've slowed, slowed down with my attitudes, enjoyed every session. Dr. Harris, thank you for your dedication to your, um, looks like, I, I don't know. It's been a profitable experience for me. Sandra Harris, PhD. Thank you for making me comfortable enough to show my heart, and especially my soul. Over three decades being outside of myself, I will never forget the humanness and acceptance. Thank you. Good luck, Doc, was another one. When I, when the veterans first called me Doc, I thought, well, that's a little flippant, but I came to understand that was the ultimate compliment. Because these young men with their rifles would surround the medic or the corpsman who had had six months of medical training and didn't carry a rifle. And they would put down their life for the medic. So I moved to Scottsdale. That was my second retirement. And I got my license. This is a state exam. And to keep your license, you need to go to continuing education workshops. So I went to one in a hotel, and I didn't know anybody because I was new to the state. And the way we le one way we learn is to practice with each other, whatever it was we were technique we were learning, and we practice with each other. And at the end of the day, my partner says, "I'm the director of counseling services at ASU, and I have." a senior level position you might want to apply for. So I applied and I went back to work at ASU in counseling services. I got up on my 70th birthday and I felt good that I had good health, I still had my wits about me, and I had a good job. But I was also parking on the top level of a parking structure and that summer would walk to the administration building to my office and work all day and then walk back to the car and driving home in that heat I thought I really don't need to be doing this anymore. I've done it for 30 years and so I was only there one year and retired. That was the third time which was 12 years ago. Um, I then went through what I consider an existential crisis. I thought, am I going to die knowing all of what I know about the veterans and what they went through and how they might be helped because I can't write about case studies, I don't have their permission and the material is confidential. So I, but I did like writing, I joined the Scottsdale Society of Women Writers and I attended their monthly meeting with speakers. And I spoke with one speaker about this frustration and she said, you can write fiction you can have composite characters where you use what you know from different people, but they would never recognize themselves in the way that you blend all their character characteristics together. Oh, I thought fiction. This is a different genre from the scientific, very structured writing that I had done all my professional life. So I had to learn how to write fiction. And, um, I started attending conferences for writers, went, went to uh, Seattle and Portland and, and uh, Santa Barbara, for example. I traveled to Genoa, Italy with a group of women writers from this group. I began writing, which two years later, 
turned out to be shrapnel, a journey toward psychological healing. I went every day to the coffee bean in my neighborhood, and I waited until my table was available, and then I sat in the corner, and I laughed and cried with these characters, the funny things they had said, the sadness that they had gone through. I, I did that every day for two years. And uh, it is the story of a group of veterans who go back to Vietnam 30 years post-traumatization to visit the places where they were traumatized. And there are eight characters. Five were more severely uh, wounded. And shrapnel is an invisible wound. It's our emotional wounds that were brought back. And so five were more uh, deeply wounded. Uh, one was, they all had post-traumatic stress, but one was a clinical psychologist who was a leader of the group. One was a Baptist minister, and one was a rabbi who uh, accompanied the group. I wanted the book to cover not only the psychological healing, but the spiritual healing as well. You really are a lifelong learner. It was interesting to hear you um, go through the journey of education for the young, the young woman who is afraid to go and learn, yeah. and then the more mature adult who was eagerly grasping and going for new learning. Very, very interesting. But there also Thank is you. a life before 30 years. Yes. And I'm wondering if you'd like to share with us some of that story. I think I had a very interesting background, mm -hmm. Sharon, growing up. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. My parents were born and raised in El Paso. Actually, my mother was in a small town in um, New Mexico, but they moved to the big city of El Paso when she was a girl. Um, my grandparents immigrated from Lithuania. They opened a store, Bellman, Bellman's Dry Goods, which was on the border of Juarez, Mexico, and El Paso. And the border the border was very porous, and so Mexicans would come over and would buy the goods that they were selling in the dry goods store. It could be blue jeans, uh, Stetson hats, yard goods, shirts, and they hired uh, the Mexicans as help also. My grandparents learned English and, and Spanish. and. They had such a deep regard for education that they insisted that their three daughters leave Texas to go to college. So I'm talking about 1930, when not all girls were even encouraged to go to college. They had to leave Texas to get a broader, to expand their horizons. So my mother, at the age of 15, she had started school early, they didn't have any rules. Um, at the age of 15, and her older sister each got a new dress, and they were put on a train in El Paso for Chicago. Uh, and they got their degrees from Northwestern University, and their younger sister, graduated from Berkeley. My father went to Baylor Medical School. He came home to administer the anesthesia for my birth. Not that he was an anesthesiologist, but they didn't have one, <laughs> I guess. And then he went to Chicago for his residency at Cook County Hospital in dermatology, and then he was a practicing dermatologist for 30 years there. 
He also served in the military. I don't know if you want me to go whatever you'd like to that share. way. My dad fought, fought his way into World War II, into the military. He was given a 4F rating for being underweight, but he said, I'm a physician and I'm going. And so he spent five years uh, in the Army, Army Medical Corps, ending as a lieutenant colonel. And he was stationed in the Philippines and on Guam, uh, missing three years of my childhood from the time I was three to six. He was uh, serving uh, in the military. And then I do remember his homecoming at the El Paso Depot when I was six. So you had veterans in your heart, both personally as well as professionally. When I first started seeing my groups, and really they wanted to know what makes me think that I'm qualified to work with them, they said, did you serve? And I said, no, I didn't serve, but I come from a very patriotic family our country, right or wrong. And my father served, and I, I described what I just described to you. And um, they accepted that, that I might be able to <laughs> understand them. And also, I was working with them at the end of my career, and really what they wanted was help. If there was someone, didn't really matter if she had been in the service or not, if she could help me, that was what was important. Mm -hmm. And what was the difference between the students at, uh, in California, uh, North, North, right? Northridge. Northridge. And ASU. There was a different time and different, um, when you think about your role at ASU. Well, at ASU, I, I was only there for a year, mm -hmm. and I would say that um, the students, it was a diverse population also, but maybe there weren't as many students returning to the school, to school late in life. Mm -hmm. I think that they were probably more college age, mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. speaking, than, you know, at Northridge, like I might be counseling a woman who is 50, let's say. She's about to get her degree, and she would, might say, I really want to be a lawyer, but I'm 50. And I wouldn't hear, I wouldn't put up with that. I would say, and how old will you be in three years if you don't do it? <laughs> and I would encourage them in every way I could to follow their heart and not limit themselves by their age. Well, now we think, you know, to go to law school at 50, that would be hard, but it wouldn't be impossible as they thought. But I think at ASU, well, the bread and butter of any uh, counseling service is depression and anxiety. Those are the big um, disorders that we all need to know how to work with, and then other specialties. And so I would still see students who were experiencing uh, depression. I don't recall suicidality at ASU in the one year I was there. The average number of actual suicides for a mental health professional who's been in the field 30 years is one, that we do experience one a as an average. And I did have that at Northridge, so I have been through that. And um, I, um, there was something that 
went through my head and why don't you ask the next question? I don't know what it was. I'm also wondering yes. if you could have had a conversation between that dean's wife, who you were, you were the dean's wife, mm -hmm. and then the professor at Northridge, ASU, what, what would you have taught each other? You had a group with those two women. <clears throat> those two women in it. One is the young, 30-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Entertaining the faculty. Or and the, entertaining and doing for others. And then it crossed my mind that the professional is also doing for others. So that's, that's how they were similar, is being helpful. I was being helpful. Uh, to his career and helpful to faculty. And um, then becoming a helping professional. Um, so I think I, I, I maintained that, but um, the professional came to hear her own voice I learned by then to speak up and speak out and speak for and be very proud of who I was and where I had come from, where I had come, a very conservative household. And um, became uh, more of the potential that I'm sure I, that I always had, but very grateful for the one or two people that recognized that. No one in my family had encouraged me in this direction, and I'm not leaving anybody out there, mm -hmm. as long as I could maintain what I was doing and take on full-time graduate school and, and working, then it was all fine. But um, I think I learned that I could, I could do it all, which included being mother to my children. Mm -hmm. It's just that it wasn't all at once. Mm -hmm. It was in stages. Mm -hmm. That's probably as good as I can do. It's interesting because I know you as a resident here, being a very kind, thoughtful, caring person. Thank you. And yet I also know about Doc Harris Snow. <laughs> and she had a very, very interesting life. And you helped bring people out, whether it was the veterans, yourself, um, You've contributed a great deal to many people that may not be able to say thank you to you, but would like to. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. It was it was a pleasure for me to do it. And uh, okay. thanks a lot. Good. And if anybody in the future would like to do it, please call me or sign up on getting to know you because everybody has interesting stories and we would like to know this tapestry of relationships in the little community that we live in. Thank you very much and thank you for contributing, Sandra. Certainly.